All right, and welcome to Riverdale's Senior College Night. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing a screen. I'm going to run through some slides. Uh, it's a lot of information that as senior parents, you probably have already covered before. Uh, there will be some new information there. Uh, I just spent four days up in Seattle at the NACAC conference, uh, which is the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. Uh, in total, I think there were 3,200 uh, college counselors and admissions professionals up, uh, up in Seattle at the time. I think we had another 1,500 that joined online or so. Um, so it quite quite large, and then pretty much every college was represented at the time. So I got to ask a lot of questions for students uh, who I knew were interested in particular colleges. Uh, so we are trying to bring a lot of that information in this presentation. So it should be a little new, um, but it will be rehearsing a little bit of kind of the senior year and what that application process is gonna look like and how it's going to uh, be structured because it will slightly change based on a, a few things that have changed over the past, I would say six months or so. So, all right, let me share my screen here. <clears throat> All right. So senior college night, um, hopefully it's the right date. So I, most of you will probably already know this at this point in time, uh, but there are generally two main waves of college applications. And most of our students generally have targeted the first in the past. Um, but with that said, I, I honestly think that because of the unique situation that this class has been in, colleges are really expecting a heavy hit on wave two. Uh, they know that a lot of students are behind. They know that college lists are still being molded at this time, that, that kids haven't really been able to visit colleges all that well uh, during the past few months. And so generally they are uh, trying to factor that in to their own approach to early action, early decision and the like. Uh, but they do know it's coming. So it's if, if your kid is applying in wave two and they normally would have applied in wave one, it's perfectly understandable given the situation that we're in at this time. So those first early action, early decision dates are usually November 1st, November 15th. I do know we have one student who has a very early, early action date of October 15th. Uh, so there are exceptions, obviously. Um, those are the two main ones there. Uh, there will obviously be a few colleges that diverge here and there. Uh, so keep that in mind. They have about a month at this point. Uh, most of the kids who are targeting that early action deadline have been in constantly in, in my office. And so I'm not, not really worried about them hitting that at, at all. Our teachers know of the deadlines. Uh, they're handling the recommendations well. I think, honestly, uh, this senior class has been good about spreading out who they're asking uh, recommendations from. And so that's kind of taken the pressure off of some of the teachers in the past that have been writing 20 or 30 recommendations. Uh, so this year, I, I, I really don't think that there's going to be any trouble kind of missing or uh, getting to those deadlines. Um, so, <clears throat> all right. Um, after your students are admitted, uh, generally they will have until May 1st in order to make a decision. So a lot of colleges will pressure you and they'll, they'll throw, you know, different stats and figures at you and, and talk about housing and things like that. We can discuss that if a college is really pursuing that with you. But in all honesty, they have till May 1st to make a decision with the exception of early decision, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So don't think that they are pressed for time. If they're applying early action, they hear back in December that they have to let the college know right then. Uh, they have substantial, a substantial amount of time. And student interests change over four or five months. So I really would give it, you know, three or four months before you're, you're confirming, even if you already know or have heard back from all the schools to which you applied. <clears throat> so just to rehearse the differences here, uh, so early action versus early decision, because there's so much confusion that surrounds the two, uh, it is important to kind of highlight the distinction between them. Uh, so in early action, as I said, students are usually applying by November 1st or November 15th, though there is that October 15th deadline for University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, early action is not binding. And so students are like, well, why, why would I do it then, right? Well, the advantage is that you hear back 
you know, by mid December, usually it's usually the second week or third week of December. And that can be incredibly important in terms of determining where else that you would want to apply. Uh, students are, because you already have most of your essays written at that point, they're a little malleable in the sense that if they're not hearing things that are positive, you're able then to add a bunch of schools to your list and kind of adapt to that news and then apply to a significant number regular decision. Uh, there will also be other reasons that I'll mention here in a second. Um, but that's kind of one of the main advantages. And you, then you get to think about it for, for months, um, possibly even visit uh, whether it's over Christmas break or whether we're over spring break. Uh, so you can start setting that stuff up knowing that you've already been accepted. So it does confer certain advantages. Uh, whether it confers an advantage in terms of acceptance rate is a little ambiguous, uh, simply because typically the strongest students apply early action. So it does look on the face of it that there's a higher admit rate for early yeah. action, but that may just simply be the type of students that are applying under early action rather than them favoring early action per se. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, students can be admitted, denied, or deferred to regular decision. And that deferred is an important one uh, that students often are a little bit surprised of. Sometimes schools need more information and so students get pushed to regular decision instead of getting an answer right away on that early action uh, application, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? They usually just want to see some more grades. They want to look at the broader applicant pool. Um, so a student is still in it when they are deferred. And I, you know, it's, it's one thing I really encourage students to bring up to me if they have been deferred so that we're able to stay on top of it and make sure that that school has all the information uh, for the next month so that they're able to reach uh, whatever decision it is that they're going to. Uh, early decision. So the difference here, and we, we have a lot of students do an early decision this year, and it, it is understandable. Uh, so early decision is binding. Uh, you are telling the college that if you if they accept you, you're going to withdraw all other applications and enroll. Um, you have to sign, uh, so the student signs an agreement, the parents sign an agreement. I sign the agreement in, in Naviance here. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. But, but we're basically saying that if you get in, we are going to pull your applications. Now, the only t uh, exception for that tends to be financial circumstances. They, it just The financial offer comes back and it's just something that a family absolutely cannot afford. Uh, but that's, you, you end up having to ask the college for permission to get out of the ED agreement. It's not just simply you can shoot them an email and say, hey, I can't pay for the college, uh, therefore we're, we're out of this, right? Um, it's, it's something that you have to be released from, from the college. And breaking that agreement could lead to negative consequences. Um, it's, it, you know, if it gets around, if a college finds out that you've reneged on ED, it can be problematic. It can be problematic for Riverdale itself if we're allowing kids to do that. So keep in mind that that, that impacts not just your student and their other applications, but also Riverdale itself. And that, you know, when I sign my name to that ED agreement, I'm, I'm signing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to that, right, when it really comes down to it. Um, Oh, the percentage of students that get in from a deferred uh, status, at least that's a great question. It really depends. Uh, so there are some schools that are legendary for deferring, uh, Georgetown, for instance. Uh, and I honestly want to say it's 1% on the Georgetown. It's, if you get deferred from Georgetown, it's, it's basically a rejection at that point, right? Um, but there are other schools. A lot of the UC schools use their def uh, deferral system, Berkeley, for instance, and they go to it quite a lot. Uh, so it really is school dependent there. Um, there's no way to kind of generalize over uh, the entire population. Uh, but on ED, increase the likelihood of acceptance. So it really does because you are saying that you are going to go there. And so they know if they accept you, that you are enrolling right away, it does give a measurable uptick in terms of the acceptance. Uh, some schools, it could be nearly double what their acceptance rate usually is in terms of early decision. Um, but it can, and this is an important point, it can decrease financial aid award offers. Uh, so if they, if they feel, I mean, if you're doing an ED agreement, you're saying that you are going to that school if they accept you no matter what. 
And so they feel less obligated to incentivize you to go to their school. And that's what a lot of financial aid awards, as we'll cover next week, are intended to do is act as that incentive to get you to buy their product. Uh, so it's worth being aware of. There are There is that cost. At some schools, that's not so much a factor. If a school is meeting 100% of demonstrated need, for instance, which we'll talk about next week, that's not likely a factor. Um, but at some schools, it still really is. And so it's something that you really want to keep in mind as a family, uh, if you're worried about paying for college, because ED can really drastically impact just how much college costs over those four years. Uh, and if a student's denied or deferred, and you can be deferred under ED, uh, the student's no longer bound by the ED agreement. And that, I think that's a key point because that happens quite a lot. So you apply early decision and you get deferred and they're saying, we're going to push you to regular decision. And students are like, well, am I still, you know, stuck with this if, if it, going forward? And the answer is no. As soon as you are deferred, you are released from that early decision agreement. So... And then you also have uh, something called restricted early action. Uh, I don't think we have too many students that are interested in REA schools and nobody to my knowledge is applying REA at this point, but that obviously could change in a week's time as it often does. Uh, so it's worth just briefly mentioning. Uh, so this would be uh, Harvard, St uh, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, Notre Dame, a few others have entered this restricted early action policy instead of early action and early decision. Uh, so under restricted early action, you are basically telling a college that you are going to apply to them early, and then you are not going to apply to any other private colleges under their early action plan. Uh, so that kind of the key principle, it restricts where else you can apply. Students can apply to other public colleges under their early action plans. So let's put it in practice. If you apply to Notre Dame, restricted early action, you could apply to University of Oregon and Oregon State under their early action plan. That's fine. But as soon as you start looking at uh, Lafayette College, for instance, you could not apply early action to Lafayette because it's a private college, right? Um, so only public schools in that sense would be allowed under the restricted early action plan. You can still apply to everything regular decision. That's perfectly fine. And it is a non-binding agreement. So if Notre Dame came back and said, yeah, we want you to come to our school, you're, you don't have to go there. You can, you can still apply and hear back from other schools at that point. But you're only able to kind of apply to those other schools if they're private under their uh, regular decision plan. So, oh, thank you, Emily. That's a, that's a good point. I, I skipped over that. So the difference between early decision one and two, uh, it, it was done at the realization that students have, I mean, it, it, it's so hard to decide between colleges, right? And many colleges are so similar and students are kind of pigeonholed to focus on one for early decision and, and they go for it. Uh, so a lot of schools have introduced what's called uh, early decision two. And early decision two, the deadline is usually after uh, when you would hear back from your early decision one school. So it's basically the same policy. You apply early decision one to one school, let's say University of Pennsylvania. Uh, you don't hear back from them, uh, positive news. So you, maybe you're deferred or maybe you're just denied. And so now you're free of your early decision agreement and you're like, well, there's this second school that I really wanna go to as well. So at that point you can enter into an early decision two agreement with that other school. And so that's why they've implemented that. A lot of schools have introduced early decision two again this year, Carnegie Mellon, for instance, has traditionally just been an ED1 school. They just introduced ED, uh, ED2 this year. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. <clears throat> it, uh, it definitely still boosts your chances of acceptance. Uh, it carries a lot of the same you know, virtues, but it, it technically is your second option, right? And I've had some students that have seen ED2 and think that it's just a later date. Um, but technically, it's it's for kids that did ED1, right? That's that's why it was designed. So there may be a slightly lower admit rate for ED2. It just really depends upon the school. 
And Oscar had a great question. Is restricted early action limited further along the lines of U.S. private accredited uh, for a year? Uh, so <clears throat> it really depends on the school. And sometimes we have to email them and ask them questions, right? Uh, so if a student's applying to the U.K., for instance, and then the kind of the private public becomes a little bit blurred at that point, it's, it's a question that you have to ask the admissions team. Uh, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Restricted early action is just, it's, it's complicated, but it, it's largely intended to keep kids from applying to Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale all at the same time under their, uh, that's why it exists, right? Um, and so that's something to keep in mind, but ultimately we end up sometimes having to ask questions of the particular institution of what a student's allowed to do. And I'm more than happy to broker that discussion too. So if, if students wanted to do the REA plan and has questions about a particular school, I, I will go ask that question. Any other questions on early action, early decision, restricted early action? Sometimes they call restricted early action single choice. They just like to make things really confusing for everybody. So just be aware of that. Um, if you're confused about an admissions policy, please just let me know. I'll, I'll explain it. And if not, I'll, I'll talk to the admissions team and, and they'll explain it to me. But it really falls into those three categories, uh, depending on what title it is that they're giving it to it. And then there's a regular decision. Uh, so regular decisions are usually, the deadlines are usually January or February. And so the two important ones, I think for our, our class is University of Oregon is January 15th and Oregon State is February 1st. It is important to note that Oregon has done uh, like an audit of their system, both Oregon and Oregon State and their early action and regular decision, your student does not have any, any, greater chance of being accepted under early action than regular decision. They keep it consistent the whole way through. Uh, they're really looking at a student's metrics and whether they're qualified to enter. It has nothing to do with how many they're allowed to admit at that point in time. Uh, so you are not disadvantaged whatsoever by applying to Oregon or Oregon State on January 15th or February 1st. California public universities are a little confusing to a lot of our students. I just got some new questions today about them. Uh, I have a lot of experience with these, but uh, can you be surprised how many kids miss the deadlines uh, for, for University of California because they think the November 30th deadline is early action, but it's not, they don't have early action. They only have a November 30th regular decision. And that goes for the Cal State system and the UC system. Uh, so if your child is looking at those schools, November 30th, it is incredibly early. Uh, that may be the earliest apps that they have if they were really targeting a uh, regular decision there. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so why does OSU in, uh, do early action then? Because it comes with that advantage of hearing back early and other schools are doing it. It also spaces out the demand that they have. Because if, if you shift that then and you get all of your applications on January 15th, it, it's a nightmare to try to get through those in two months, right? Whereas if you can space that out from November 1st all the way to January 15th or February 1st, it's going to be so much easier to kind of kind of work through that material. So um, that's one of the reasons Oregon itself actually even uh, assesses things on a rolling basis after that date. So anything that comes in, they just assess as it comes in. Uh, so even their kind of January 15th, February 1st, if you applied on December 1st, you're going to hear back before people that applied on, on January 14th. Uh, but January 15th and February 1st are kind of their cutoffs is how they're projecting that. And that's largely just because of the volume of applications that they are receiving at this time. They, I mean, they went up. It was, asked, I don't have to figure out the top of my head right now. I was actually in a meeting with uh, Oregon State's dean this morning. Um, but the, the, the amount of applicants to public schools right now is just astronomical. Uh, the Honors College, for instance, uh, I think it, the applications went up like 500% or something like that. It was, it was ridiculous. So that's one of the reasons that they're doing the early action. Um, and it's, it's to mimic other schools. But that's also why you have schools like UC and Cal State, uh, which are, have an early deadline. It's a regular decision. 
but they're saying, we're not going to get back to you until March anyway, right? But they want to get those applications in so that they actually have the time to review. So uh, many schools that have early decision do not also have early action. And this is this is a key point. So why, why does radio decision exist for so many schools? Well, because some schools with early decision policies where a kid isn't sold on that school early decision, they only have regular decision after that. Uh, so naturally, a lot of students will still be forced to do that regular decision, decision route, which is good because it spaces out applications, gives you time to work through things. Uh, but it's just, uh, it's, it, it's a, a policy that helps them, I think, uh, really focus on their first applicant pool before taking in everybody else. Uh, some schools also have rolling admissions. Uh, as we, I mentioned, Oregon is, is slightly rolling, although they actually have dates in mind. Uh, but other schools will just assess students as they apply. So Arizona State has been famous. Oregon State has been famous for this too. Uh, I had a student apply to Arizona State last year. And three days later, I think they, they got a text message telling them that they had, they had been accepted. Uh, so they're definitely trying to evaluate those very quickly and to kind of connect with students in you know, original ways in that sense. Uh, and so you'll find a lot of rolling admissions policies as well. Um, so basically they are just going to be admitting students until the class is full. Any questions on regular decision? Check in the chat here. All right, standardized testing. And this is the, uh, the big, the big one that a lot of people have questions about. Um, if I, you know, I've, I've probably talked to your student if they've been in my office about this uh, based off of the schools that they're looking at. Uh, there was some really good information presented at NACAC that we're gonna go over here. But the key takeaway I think for, uh, for most people is that many schools are test optional. And if you're applying to public universities, it is most likely they are test optional. And they really mean that they're test optional at this point. Um, if you're applying to Oregon, Oregon State, so let, um, let me run through like an application that actually would make sense. Let's pretend you're applying to some of the UCs, a few Cal State schools, maybe Cal Poly is usually popular with Riverdale students. You're applying to Oregon, Oregon State, University of Washington, Western Washington. You're applying to University of Colorado Boulder, Arizona State, University of Arizona. Boise State, Montana State, University of Montana. These are all really popular schools at Riverdale uh, for those big public schools. You don't need the SAT or ACT, period. I uh, don't need to worry about it. Those schools are either not looking at them, period. The UC system, for instance, is no longer legally allowed to look at SAT or ACT scores, or it's just not factoring into their admissions decisions. So you have a huge portion of universities that our students apply to that are not concerned with standardized testing whatsoever. So if it's a public university you're looking at, it's unlikely, there are still some, but it's unlikely that you are going to need standardized testing. The longer a school has also been test optional, uh, the more likely it really is so. Uh, so, you know, they've, they've, they've gotten it down how to review applicants without test scores uh, and without using that as kind of a, you know, a way to separate out some of the applications. And so generally, they're a little bit better about doing so. Uh, so my, my verdict for a lot of kids, if a student hasn't taken the test yet, it's probably best right now to, con uh, to concentrate on constructing a balanced list of schools and focusing on your essays, knocking out your classes this trimester, uh, rather than really trying to cram last minute for a test. Um, I know some students are using the SAT that we're offering at Riverdale as their, their last attempt, right? And that's a different story, right? But if you're like, oh, we need to sign up for that SAT now, uh, so let's spend a month of like really cramming for this, you're gonna end up detracting from a lot of the other elements that go into the application and it's probably not going to give them a measurable benefit, so. But some important data, and this will be relevant to some of your, your students uh, because I know where they are applying. Uh, so this is from directly from a presentation, a Pragmatic Discourse on Test op uh, Optional Emissions 
It was done by Ben Neely, who's been around for a lot, a long time. He was a math teacher, I think, for 20 years in the Bay Area. And then he started Revolution Prep, which is uh, one of the largest online prep organizations for uh, pretty much any, any tutoring that you would possibly need. Uh, and they've actually been an incredible resource for a lot of schools because they, they were virtual before it was popular. They've been using Zoom for like, you know, since it, since it originally started. Uh, but anyway, so Ben Neely kind of spearheaded this. Uh, in addition to that, you had Ed Devine. So Ed's at Xavier now. Uh, he used to be at Lafayette uh, until last year, I believe. And then Xavier allowed him to move to Hawaii uh, with his wife and kind of be a, an admissions rep over there for the West Coast. So I think he he jumped on that. Uh, Rosemary Martin, too. She's at St. John's College High School. It's, uh, I think, like a 170-year-old high school in Washington, D.C. area. Um, so three I mean, people have been in the field for quite a long time really took a look at a lot of the admissions data in terms of standardized testing. And it came to some unfortunate but surprising conclusions. Well, not surprising to a lot of people. I think it's pretty consistent with what I've been saying for the past year and a half, uh, but let's dive in. Uh, so uh, the data is gonna be limited and that's mainly because of the 300 schools who went test optional and were researched for this study, only 21 have released detailed admissions data. And that's obviously gonna be for a reason, uh, as you're about to see here in a second. So some key distinctions is uh, there's a category that's been uh, singled out called test neutral. Uh, so students who choose to submit scores can't be disadvantaged by the score if it's lower than the typical admitted range. Uh, so this is brilliant. I, I was actually talking with a few schools that had policies in place and how they actually did this. And they've, they've introduced what's called pre-screeners. And so your, your student submits their scores and the rest of their application. And the pre-screener looks at everything and looks at the score and like, oh, that's, that's not a good score, right? And so what they do is they actually pretend like you check the box of don't look at my standardized test scores. And they just remove it from the file and then give the file to the admissions committee. So the admissions committee has no idea that you submitted test scores, even though you probably shouldn't have, right? And so in this sense, they're not biased whatsoever by that uh, lower than average score. And that pre-screener is kind of acting in a way that is consistent with the admitted classes in the past. So really brilliant idea. Uh, so students who choose to not submit scores are not disadvantaged, obviously, because the admissions committee has no idea who did and who did not submit scores. They're really just looking at the applications at that point. And the submitted test scores contributed min minimally or not at all to the admissions decision. Uh, and that's kind of the key thing, that if you look at the correlation between test scores in the past and now, it really doesn't look like they, they contributed that much to whether a student was accepted or denied. So this is what most people think when they hear test optional, right? Test neutral, this is what test optional is in the minds of most people. So what's the benefit of submitting test uh, scores, test neutral, if the test scores are not strong? So here, there's no benefit is, is the point, right? If it doesn't fall in their middle 50, they're probably not even gonna see them. But the important thing there is it's also not a penalty, right? Um, but the the, the problem, as we're about to see, is you don't necessarily know what schools are test neutral. I have a list of ones I'm going to give you, but that's that doesn't encapsulate all of them, right? There's, there's, you know, was it so 279 other schools in the study there that we don't know about, right? And so the categories are important, and kind of the the realization that you're not quite sure which one is which. If a school has been test optional for a long time it's more likely that they're, they're in the test neutral category. Um, so University of Chicago, I mean, excellent, excellent, excellent school, 6% acceptance rate. They were one of the first big major universities to go test optional. And they, they are probably, they haven't released their data, but they are most likely in this test neutral uh, zone right here, right? Um, so it, that's probably a useful guide, but there's just no way to look at a school and say that's test neutral without seeing a lot more context. You also have test aware. 
Uh, and this is also, I, I would say most people, when they think test optional, it's straddling uh, one of these two. So students who choose to submit scores may be disadvantaged by the score if it's meaningfully lower. And then you, if it's higher, you're, you're going to have some sort of advantage. Um, so this is why if you've, you've heard me in the past, I say, if you're wanting to know whether you should submit a score, just Google what the middle 50% SAT or ACT score was for that school. And if your score's in, in that range, then it's a, probably a good idea to submit at that point. If it's not in that range, I probably wouldn't at that point, unless you're well over the range, obviously. That, that goes without saying. But if you're under that range, it is probably not a good idea to do so. Uh, and a lack of score submission is a slight detractor on the strength of an application. So um, as we'll, we'll talk about some of the reasons why that may be the case and why it's only a slight detractor. And keep in mind, again, these are real people that are looking at applications that are factoring in student circumstances as well. Uh, but it does, from the, from the data itself, look like there was a disadvantage if you didn't submit it. And then the big one is test preferred. And uh, this is what everybody fears. And it's going to be a, more schools than you think here in a second. Uh, so student scores are a preferred component for admissions. And that if you don't submit them, it's going to mean a, you know, a significant disadvantage at that point. So a specific qualified rationale may be asked to explain why a student didn't submit. So if they're looking at a student, they're like, where are they from? Did they have opportunities to take the test? Why wouldn't this person give me an SAT score? And then the test scores or components of the scores are key drivers when making that decision. And we'll see that pretty clearly here in a second in just the numbers. So... Test neutral, test aware, test preferred. <clears throat> All right, so let's get to the test neutral category first. Uh, so some of these were, were actually a surprise to me. Uh, so USC was, was the biggest surprise when this showed up. Uh, so what you're looking at here, if you look at the far right, uh, you get the overall ad admit rate for that particular school. Uh, so Northeastern uh, is about 18%. We had actually three students in the Northeastern last year, uh, and two ended up going. Uh, so Northeastern is about 18%, USC 12%. And then if you're looking at the testing advantage factor, it's basically asking, given that overall admit rate, how much of an advantage did submitting the test score give you? And obviously, at, at a lot of schools, it's slight, right? At Northeastern, it was zero. That's, that's just phenomenal, right? But you suddenly see at Fordham, at USC, it's, it, there, there is a little bit of advantage in giving that added metric to them, but it's not something that's going to make or break the application at the end of the day, right? There could have been some other factors there that were at play for those students. It's just too hard to say when you're looking at a 27 or 29% bump there. Uh, Vanderbilt was also a, a big surprise to me because they traditionally liked standardized testing in the past. Uh, so, but that Northeastern at 0% was, was astounding, I think. They obviously got it down. And that is one of the schools that used that pre-screening uh, policy there that I think a lot of schools will implement this year. Uh, so, test neutral. So, you're test aware. <clears throat> University of Georgia, Tufts, et cetera. So, Amherst, it should be mentioned, actually had one of its, one of its most diverse classes ever. Uh, that they admitted this year uh, demographically. They just did an astounding job of creating this uh, class that's truly representative of, of, of America in many ways. They still kept that overall admit rate at 8%. Uh, and the testing advantage, it, it did confer some advantage. It is uh, you know, still a way that they single out uh, talented students. And some of them base that off of uh, you know, where you're at school as well. And if you, for instance, were at an inner city school and had a slightly higher SAT than most of your peers, that actually counted in your favor in those cases, even though it wasn't within Amherst's original uh, range that they were previously looking at. Um, so it does, it does influence it, um, but it's not as big as we're about to see. Uh, so how can a school be test preferred or anything if most of the standardized tests have been canceled? So most of the most of this that's a key question, and we'll get to this here in a second in uh, some of the the next slide. But most of the tests on the West Coast is the answer there, right? Um, not most of the t the tests in Middle America. Not most of the tests 
on the East Coast. Uh, it is it is primarily afflicting the, the West Coast at this point. Uh, so that is something that we'll factor in and we'll kind of look at the statistics with that that view. Uh, but but that is the reality that, you know, I would say 70 percent of America. That's not the case that test centers are uh, canceling constantly. But it's definitely a real problem for our students here. <clears throat> and here's the big slide. So test preferred. Um, so, yeah, we have, we have a lot of students interested in Emory. And the, the reality is, is that if you submit test scores within their range, uh, you're light years more likely to, to be accepted to the school. Um, and that's, that's just the data that's talking. Um, you see Georgia Tech there as well at the very top. Georgetown honestly wasn't a surprise. Georgetown still hasn't even modified their application. They still say that they require SAT, ACT when you're filling out the application, even though they don't require it. And that's because as soon as this is over, they're going back to standardized testing. They have, they're not, they're, they're not even talking about it. It, it. They will go back to their original policy in the future. Right now, they are test optional just simply because mainly because West Coast applicants can't apply uh, to Georgetown if they're not test optional, um, but they will be going back at some point. Um, so you have a distinct advantage at a lot of these schools. Uh, and I will say we, we got students into several of these without standardized tests, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's still doable. Uh, it's you know not the end of the world if, you want to, if your student's looking at one of these without standardized test scores. Uh, but they definitely would prefer that your students send those scores. So naturally, I, you know, there are some confounding factors. So as I, I reflected on this, and I've got a, a lot of background in standardized testing, I had a, a lot of questions. And uh, I, I do think that it leads to some gaps, some positive and some negative. So let's start with the negatives real fast. Uh, the admit rates are deceiving. And they're often much lower than advertised, right? So let's go back real quickly and just look at Notre Dame. Uh, so Notre Dame, their overall admit rate was 15%. Uh, so they their, their class, their incoming class was 2,000 students. Uh, they had like a 52 or 53% yield. So that means they only admitted about 4,000 kids, all right, into to Notre Dame. Uh, so 4,000 kids that they admitted. And now you have to subtract from that all the athletes, right? Because the athletes applied and they're much less likely to be applying with standardized test scores. And then you have to subtract the Pell Grant students. So 20% of the incoming class uh, was either Pell Grant or first generation college students. And those students, as we know, are statistically less likely to submit test scores. And so it starts to look like you know, you could probably shave off another four or five percentage points there of students that were admitted for other reasons and then focus on the kids that actually were in a different applicant pool and applying and then look how standardized testing scores impacted that. And so in all honesty, it's probably much, much, much worse for all of these schools, all of whom have big sports teams and a big concentration on bringing in first-gen students uh, and Pell Grant students. Uh, can you find the percentage for test preferred for other schools online? No, this is these are right now at least the only schools that have, have released their admissions data. Uh, that's just, schools are very secretive about that. Uh, some are a little bit more open than others. Uh, but th this is where we're at right now. Hopefully over the next months, we actually see a little bit more as well. Um, and hopefully by next year, it's, it's different, but that doesn't really help you all right now. <clears throat> Oops. So the admit rates may, may be different, which means that it may be even a more, you know, more of an advantage to, to submit standardized test scores. Um, but the other thing is, and this kind of echoes Lisa's point, um, we don't know, we don't have the regional data, right? So if we're looking at students admitted from the West Coast and how standardized tests impacted 
being accepted to these colleges when you're on the West Coast, where it was almost impossible to take a test, right? It could be much, much higher, right? Or sorry, much the, the, uh, the advantage factor could be much lower for West Coast students, right? Um, because they're looking at the situation and their regional reps know the particular area that they're in charge of and know that students weren't able to take the standardized test at that time. So that is one thing that, that can play here. And I think we saw a lot of that. We had some students that were accepted to exceptional, exceptional programs last year that traditionally like standardized testing and they didn't have standardized tests. And I think that's largely because you say, oh, you're from Portland, right? Yeah, it was impossible to take an SAT or ACT there. And so you have real people that are looking at these applications and they're judging it based off of their knowledge of the area. And they are very knowledgeable of the area. Um, it's also fair to assume that there's a greater dependency on such testing in some majors. Uh, so, you know, we could, we could probably throw MIT onto the test preferred list as well, because MIT has come out and said, no, it's, there's a direct correlation between test scores and performance at MIT, and they can, they can reveal the data. It's, it's, so, it's a huge divide in terms of test scores. And so when you see Georgia Tech on there as well, it becomes a little bit less of a surprise because of how STEM and engineering focused they are. Um, so there may be some correlation between that as well, and less so if you were wanting to study psychology or less so if you were wanting to study, um, you know, business or something like that. Um, and then schools also saw a much greater application rate among students who would previously not have applied. So, you know, students typically would have two dingers, right? They're, they're lower than the average GPA and they have a lower than average SAT score. And so they just decide not to apply. But then you subtract the SAT score and they're like, oh, I only have one metric that's lower. And so they ended up applying because of that. So these students maybe, you know, end up being rejected, not because of the absence of an SAT score, but simply because students that had that lower GPA that who wouldn't have applied normally also just happened not to submit SAT, ACT scores. Um, so in other words, there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be made clear. Um, unfortunately, we're probably not going to get access to that data, um, but it is, I mean, tangibly beneficial in the sense that we have students that are interested in, you know, 10 of these schools right here off the top of my head, right? I, I can name the kids that are applying to them. Um, so those ones are at least relevant, and it also kind of shapes how we look at uh, schools policies in the future there. <clears throat> Any questions on testing? I always worry that I'm going to be short of information. And then I, I look at my slides and I'm like, man, I should, I should be hurrying. So I, mean, I am going to be respectful of your time. Again, I have a seven week daughter. I can hear in the background right now. So I will, uh, I will definitely be ending on time here. So, all right, Naviance. Um, so ask your senior whether they've set up Naviance and if they stare at you blankly, send them to my office. Uh, this is a problem. It's just perpetual. You know, when I started my first year, uh, I had to hunt seniors down who I, I didn't even know their face or name, right, and make them get into Naviance, right? Uh, so it, it's just a perpetual battle. Most of our kids are in. We actually have now uploaded ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th and 12th. I have all of 11th and most, well, I would say most of 11th and most of 12th uh, into Naviance, and we're going to start really pushing for ninth and 10th grade to be in it as well, and we're going to be doing a lot of cool stuff with it through advisory. Uh, but we still have a few stragglers. If they haven't signed up, they really need to. And the reason why is in addition to helping them find cool colleges, majors, and careers, it's the, it's the actual way that we send our documents to colleges. And so if you're not in Naviance, you really can't apply to college. So you have to be in Naviance. Um, it's a really simple process to set it up. Kids can just bring a computer into, into my room and I will help them it's, it's incredibly easy. It's not incredibly problematic if they haven't done so at this point, um, but definitely, definitely, definitely beyond them if they haven't done so. Because that's where they also need to enter their teacher recommendations. It's how teachers monitor deadlines. So, you know, if uh, Brown has a letter to write, he will log in an Aviance, look at when it's due because it, it tells him what colleges you're applying to. 
and knows that I need to have this done by November 1st or October 15th or, oh, I can wait until January 1st on this one. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons it's important. And that's where he loads the letter uh, in order for it to be sent. I also sent out a video. Uh, most of the students have done this in my office that they've been bringing in their computers of a, how to match a Naviance with the Common App. So anything you do in Common App will actually automatically start showing up in Naviance. And so it's kind of a seamless process by which your documents are sent. And for our seniors, as I said, we'll be doing some of this in advisory, but you know, seniors can already get started on it. Uh, we, I upped our subscription last year. It's one of the things I, I'm really excited about. In the self-discovery area, there's still uh, like a, a ton of new quizzes uh, and profilers that students can take that will help them kind of better understand themselves and better understand possible majors and career paths. It'll link it with their GPA and what schools they could look at. A lot of students have done this naturally because I really talked about it a lot last year when I was in their classes for spring seminar during our limited in-person stuff uh, after school. So a lot of our, our seniors have already done so, but if, if yours haven't, hasn't and are kind of lost about what to do or who they are, the self-discovery stuff is really great. Um, it's, a lot of it's based off of Myers-Briggs or other uh, similar metrics there. Uh, so we will be bringing that into advisory, but that's uh, it's a little late, I think, sometimes for seniors who are thinking about that stuff right now. And last but not least, I believe, uh, supporting documents. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about what all this stuff is. Uh, I've shared this uh, this this chart with people many, many times. Keep in mind, it is from 2019 at this point. We don't have an updated version yet. Uh, and it just shows you what colleges place an importance on in terms of their admissions decisions. Uh, it will factor, you know, it depends on which college it is, whether it's public or private and the like there. Um, but this is the most recent data that we have. And it's, it's good stuff to go on, I think, in general. You'll obviously see the standardized testing score fall quite a bit. Uh, subject test scores don't exist anymore, so that will be falling as well. So this will change over the next few years, but it's it, it's a good guide, I think, at this present time. So um, the first two key things that we'll be sending and supporting documents are transcripts in the school profile. And that's what essentially makes up that those first three categories right there. Uh, so I work on the school profile every year. Uh, we, my actually first order of business when I started at Riverdale was to completely redo it. Uh, we were really happy with it. I uh, talked with colleges and, you know, it, it's a weird battle between too much information and too little. And so colleges at the time were like, give us, give us much less because they were getting like four or five pages of what the school was. And now they're actually, well, hey, can we have a little bit more? And so, you know, we've introduced a whole explanation of our math curriculum uh, in our school profile and how students progress through it. Uh, I've kind of lengthened our explanation of Senior X, our explanation of COVID. That will go out probably in the next week or so to, to all district families. Uh, I'm just waiting on a few other details uh, with the start of our principal, uh, hopefully next week there. Um, so you'll be able to see that, but that kind of provides the context by which they're able to assess the transcript. So they see very clearly, for instance, on the school profile that we're not an AP school, that we do honors. They can see what that is. Uh, they can see what the, the, you know, the most challenging senior courses we offer, et cetera, there. Um, so it does, a, I, I feel like it does a really good job representing who we are as a school and how to understand the transcript that's right, right in front of them if they don't know anything about us. You also have teacher recommendations, which obviously matter there. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit lower than it probably is for some students because there are a lot of schools that don't take recommendations, right? So again, you could apply to Washington, Western Washington, Oregon, Oregon State, all of the UC schools, all the Cal State schools, every school in Arizona, uh, most of the schools in California or Colorado, except for UC Boulder, every school in Montana, every school in Idaho, and you wouldn't need to teach a recommendation, right? Um, UC schools don't even look, they, they won't even accept teacher recommendations. Same with Cal State schools, same with University of Washington. Uh, so at those schools, it obviously doesn't matter at all, right? 
Um, but when you start talking about private schools, it rapidly shoots up to the top of their list. So keep that in mind. It's a little deceptive here in terms of the metrics. It really does matter if you're applying to uh, Stanford or if you're applying to Colorado College or if you're applying to Puget Sound or something like that. Uh, then there's a little bit of confusion between what the difference between the school profile and the school report is. The school report, so school profile is a profile of the school. It tells us, you know, the college what we're about so that they can better understand the context of the transcript. Uh, the school report is on your student. And it is basically an evaluation of your students alongside their peers. Uh, so it asks us to rank those students similar to teacher recommendations too. Um, you know, whether the student's course load was average or demanding, et cetera. And so we have to choose a few metrics there. Uh, we report GPA on that as well, as well as declare that we don't rank GP, uh, we don't rank students and we don't weight GPAs. So that's clearly featured in that school report so that students aren't penalized from that. Um, in addition to that, it's usually, sometimes it's synonymous and sometimes it's separated out. You have the counselor recommendation, which is what I write. Hopefully your student's been coming in and I've developed a relationship with them. It makes it so much easier to write those things knowing the student. But I could write that not knowing anybody uh, because I can look at the transcript and I can look at the rest of the student body and I go around and interview every teacher who is not writing a recommendation and ask, tell me about this student. Do you have any quotes? Do you have any stories that can help them out? Um, it's positive. It, there, there's nothing, I, I, I don't include negative information in there. Um, obviously, the stronger your student is, the more positive it becomes, right? Um, but basically, it is a, a kind of bird's eye view of your student at Riverdale. Uh, and so a lot of faculty input goes into that. It's not just an autonomous decision on my part. Uh, and I really try to be faithful and help your student out as best as possible in that. So uh, there's a counselor survey that went out. It's gone out a few times. A lot of students are just getting it to me this week, which is absolutely fine. Uh, if your student has a November 1st deadline or November 15th deadline, encourage them to get in that counselor survey because it just fills in more details about them that I could possibly include in there. Uh, application deadline for UW is November, I believe November 1st. Uh, and the acceptance rate is uh, ambiguous. Uh, they, I, they, they straight up lied to me when I asked them at NACAC. Uh, so I'm going to be honest, uh, you really had to have a, over a 3.9 uh, last year to, to get into some of the programs at, at UW. Um, and that's kind of contrary to what you see as the acceptance rate. Uh, that's mostly in-state students. Um, it, it can change. and It also depends on the major. Um, but a lot of students think UW is a safety when it's it's probably more of a um, of a match, um, sometimes even a little bit of a reach. So, um, but yeah, UW's a good one to reference here because they don't take a transcript, they don't take the school profile, they don't take teach recs, they don't take school reports, they don't take counselor recommendations. Students self-report their grades. Uh, UW only wants a transcript if you decide to go there, and that's the same for UC schools as well. So you don't get the, you know, the Riverdale experience in terms of applying uh, that you would if you were applying to, uh, you know, Reed College, for instance, who's going to take all of this information. They are really just looking at the, the numbers that you provide, what you write in your essay. It's all self-reported. Um, do schools focus on sophomore and junior grades more than freshman grades? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. So the answer is yes. Uh, UC schools, for instance, are legendary. They look at freshman grades. They do chop it off when they're doing the GPA calculation because they recalculate everything. So each admissions team has their own policy. And especially if your students kind of turned a corner, they look at that. I mean, it, 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 there are some kids where it's clear as day. They started off with A, Bs, and an occasional C. And then suddenly it's A's and B's. And then their junior year, it's all A's. And then their senior year continues with all, all A's. That is definitely a factor. Again, these are real people that are looking at these things. And they're able to kind of interpret it within that context. And you also, we, we send a schedule for senior year. Cheryl writes on this. She's getting to it right now, especially if you have an early deadline. I'm starting to call students in to make sure that they have their schedule set. Uh, and I'm on her about it because I have to, like, I can't send anything without that schedule. 
it's part of a bundle. It's a requirement in order for me to even send a transcript. Uh, so those schedules will be done. They were always done. We get them done well in advance there. I know it's it, it's October at this point, but don't be panicking just yet. It is getting sorted out uh, and I, I'm, I'm on it. So we will be sending a schedule for senior year. And that's important because uh, schools interpret, uh, you know, how how difficult your senior year is that that's factored into their admissions decision. Uh, so this is something that will probably come up in trimester two, trimester three. We have a lot of kids that saw, decide I got into college. I want to start taking it easy. And we say, well, hold up one second. You told colleges that you were taking advanced calculus and now you're telling me you're not going to take the, the last trimester of it. Um, the reality is we have to report all of those changes to the colleges. Every time I submit something to the college, I have to check whether you changed your schedule or not. Uh, so it's a big deal. And so when we get our seniors to lock in, that's why we make them sign a form. And we really want to hold you to what it is that you you signed up for. Um, and that, again, that schedule is, is a factor in admissions decisions. Uh, one last thing, I know we're about two minutes over, uh, transcripts. Uh, the schools get the date that we release our, our mid-year transcripts, so trimester one transcripts. Uh, that's the first week of December. If schools need that, they start contacting me. They email me and call me um, and let me know so that I can I can press and try to make sure that a, a particular student, their transcript is ready first so that I'm able to send that out to that college because sometimes they need more grades to make a decision. Uh, so that does happen. Schools are updated whenever that information becomes available to us. I also have colleges that will contact me and ask me for midterm grades. Uh, so they, they want to see what a student is doing right now in the class. Uh, I will typically, I'm able to stall for a few days and give the student a warning and say, hey, you have some you know assignments that are due that you haven't turned in and you have a C in this class. Your college is asking me, me for this information. Can you get that stuff in so that I'm able to give them a positive report? So I keep in touch with students through that whole process. It's nothing is going to be going on behind your back there. Um, as I said, we want the best for your student. It makes us look good. Uh, it also is the best thing for your student, which is what we want. Uh, so we'll constantly be monitoring that stuff as it goes forward. So you don't even have to ask for the mid-year transcripts to be sent. They're going to be loaded as soon as they're ready, and they're going to be off to the college uh, so that they're able to, to use that in their evaluation. And the same goes for try two grades, which can sometimes make it in time for uh, the regular decision round. So. Um, so there are general essay tips. If your student has questions, essays, because we're at 704 at this point, um, my main point on it is that a lot of students are writing rather generic essays. So here, I'll show you the slides and this will show up in the, uh, the recording there. So you can go back and read them. I will share this with people as well. Um, we have a lot of students that are writing on generic topics. The biggest point is it needs to be more reflective. It needs to be more about them, less about the family member they look up to, less about the sport that they played, less about what they accomplished, and more about themselves. Um, so in general, essays are hard. I think most kids are coming in constantly. I, you know, I have some students that have been in 20 times, 30 times probably already this trimester. Uh, some that have just been in a few times to go over their essays and uh, some essays are better than others on those first drafts. So it really just depends on what your student needs. Um, I'm always there to review that stuff. I'm reviewing them constantly throughout the day as they're sent to me. Students are walking in with their computer and showing me more. Um, please encourage them to do so. And if it's not me, it, hopefully it's somebody, right? Because there really needs to be another set of eyes is, is the broader point. Uh, and I'm not going to be offended if it's if it's somebody else, whether you're working with another counselor or tutor. Uh, it's you just got to have somebody else looking at that stuff. So um, keep that in mind. And students are sometimes shy to just to kind of show some vulnerability with their parents. So uh, sometimes they're a little hesitant to, to show you those things, but not always. So. All right. With that said, we're five minutes over. Any other questions? Looking at the chat, I guess I can clear, stop sharing here and show my face. 
you are always free to reach out to me. I, I do, I'll set up a meeting, especially if it's during the day, what have you, when the kids are in classes, you can come sit down and talk with me, even if it's just us, your student does not have to be there. If you have particular questions, I'm more than happy to do that. At other times, I have students that come into my office and parents just jump in on Google Meets and we, we do it that way or on the phone. It's really up to you. I'm here for whatever you need. So um, take advantage of that. So I appreciate everybody coming. It was a great turnout too. So uh, again, if you have questions, please, please, please let me know. Uh, this will be recorded. So we will send out that link there. So if you, you were curious about a slide or something like that. Uh, we'll send out probably the recording and a link to the slides there so that you can go over it and share it with people. Um, but take care. Have a good uh, good evening. I just learned that we don't have students at school tomorrow, too. So I guess uh, you guys got a three-day weekend. Uh, so take care, though. But bye.